So welcome to this next video in the playlist on real analysis. In this video we're going to continue with our discussion of Riemann integration and we're going to look at another important property of integration that you'll be very familiar with from calculus, namely the additivity property. Now you might not have ever heard it called that before but when I do state this property it will be something that's very familiar with you from calculus. And we will prove that this property holds true for our formal Riemann definition of integration. Now, this property holds true for not just the Riemann definition, but also the, the Bayes definition. So you're very well justified in using this property when you do integral calculus. However, obviously, we've only studied the Riemann definition of integration, so we will just prove this for the Riemann definition. So let's start then by stating the additivity property. Now, there are two parts to the additivity property. They're kind of like the two sides of the coin if the additivity property was a coin. Uh, so we will state both of these and then we'll prove both of them as well. So it's all about having the Riemann integral defined for a function on an interval and then thinking about what if you break the interval into two separate parts, is the Riemann integral going to be defined for the function just on those two separate parts and vice versa as well if it's defined on the two separate parts is it then defined on the whole thing and in fact I'll state that second part first so let's consider a function f that is defined on the interval ac and the interval ac is going to be our entire interval and we're going to split it into two separate parts so here is our interval AC, and then let's split it just for the sake of the picture here, but this could be anywhere inside that interval AC, and we'll call that point that we have split it at the point B. So we've split the interval AC into these two separate sub-intervals, the interval AB and the interval BC. So the first side of the additivity property coin is if the function is Riemann integrable on this interval AB, and it is Riemann integrable on this interval BC, then the function is integrable on the entire interval AC. And moreover, the value of that integral of the function F over the interval AC is, and you should hopefully be able to write this down, it's the value of the integral of the interval AB plus the value of the integral of the function F over the interval BC. So that is the additivity property. That's the reason it's called additivity, because you're adding the value of the integral over these two separate intervals to get the value of the integral over the entire interval. Now, so that's kind of part one, that if you have the two separate ones, if you have that it's integrable over the two separate ones, then you have that it's integrable over the entire one. Part two is kind of going the other way, if we know that it's integrable over the whole thing, it's then integrable over the two separate things. So if we now know that it's integrable over the entire interval AC, and of course we'll call the value of its integral the integral of F over the interval AC, then if you pick any point B inside that interval, it could be here, it could be here, it could be here, it could be here, or it could be here as I've drawn it on the picture, then the function will be integrable over those two separate intervals. So over this interval AB, it will be integrable over that interval, and it will also be integrable over this interval BC. And if you find the values of those integrals, again, it will then obey this property here, that the sum of those two integrals will equal the integral of the function over the entire interval. So these are the two separate bits that we want to prove, and we'll start with this part one. So to prove part one then, we want to assume the function is Riemann integrable over the interval AB and that it's Riemann integrable over the interval BC and this is, is how we'll denote the value of the integral over AB and this is how we'll denote the value of the integral over BC. And we now want to then show that it's going to be Riemann integrable over the interval AC and that the value of its integral is equal to the sum of these two things. Now before we tackle that problem specifically, I would like to actually talk about the approach that we're going to take because the approach that we're going to take is an approach that we've used in previous videos to show that things are Riemann integrable. And it's an approach that we will use many, many times in the future as well. And it will pay, in my opinion, to just talk about this approach in general because it will 
speed up my explanations in the future if you're on board with this approach and you recognise that we can do this without a huge discussion each time. So here is the approach that we're going to use. This is supposed to be the real line. And then I've got some number which I'll call x here in the real line. If you want to show that a function is Riemann integrable, let's just say over some general interval, so we're not talking about our specific problem now of proving additivity, we're just talking about some function over this interval a, b, and we want to prove that it is Riemann integrable over that interval, then of course what we need to show is that the infimum of the upper Riemann sums, and because I'm getting fed up of having to write out the full thing that I've done previously, you know, infimum over all dissections of the upper Riemann sums, like this. I'm just going to start writing things more shortly, so we'll just denote the infimum of the upper Riemann sums, inf u, and similarly for the supremum of the lower Riemann sums, we'll just denote that sup l. So, to show that this function is Riemann integrable, we of course need to show these two things, that the infimum and the supremum are equal to one another. Now, to do that, one of the things that you can do, and indeed, as I say, the strategy that we've used before in other videos, is to show that there exists some real number, x, such that there are upper Riemann sums that get indefinitely close to this x from above, and there are lower Riemann sums that get indefinitely close to x from below, where, of course, hopefully you're familiar now enough with the analytical concept of indefinitely close, but formally what that means is that whatever epsilon you take, so for all epsilon greater than zero, if you look, for instance, let's talk about the upper Riemann sums getting indefinitely close to x from above, then whatever epsilon you take, if you go forward to x plus epsilon, you will always be able to find an upper Riemann sum that is closer to x than that epsilon distance, so is between x and x plus epsilon. And similarly, for the lower Riemann sums getting indefinitely close to x from below, that means that whatever epsilon you take, if you look at the point x minus epsilon down here, you'll always be able to find a lower Riemann sum that is bigger than that, i.e. is between x minus epsilon to, eps uh, to x here. Um, so that's the formal meaning of getting indefinitely close to, but hopefully your analytical intuition is um, getting good enough that you would have realised that's what I mean uh, without me having to explain that. Anyway, so if you can show that there is such a real number where the upper Riemann sums get indefinitely close to it from above and the lower Riemann sums get indefinitely close to it from below, then that's enough. You've proven that the function is Riemann integrable, and indeed you've even found the value of the integral. It is this x. Now, why is that the case? Why is x destined to be the infimum of the upper Riemann sums and the supremum of the lower Riemann sums? Well, here is the explanation. As I say, this is a strategy that we will use over and over again, just showing that there exists this x, where the upper Riemann sums get indefinitely close to it from above, and the lower Riemann sums get indefinitely close to it from below. And each time uh, that I use this in the future, I hope not to have to give this bit of the explanation that I'm giving here now, which is why doing that is enough to show that the infimum of the upper Riemann sums is equal to the supremum of the lower Riemann sums. So here is the explanation. So why is x? Firstly, let's see why x is now has to be the infimum of the upper Riemann sums. So firstly, if it's an infimum, it has to be a lower bound for the upper Riemann sums. So why does it have to be a lower bound? Well, if it were not a lower bound, it's proof by contradiction, then there would be some upper Riemann sum that was strictly less than it. And I'm sorry, goodbye x minus epsilon, you're being replaced on this picture, I'm going to rub you out. You're being replaced by this hypothesized upper Riemann sum that is strictly less than x. Now, why can that not exist? And hopefully if you've watched some of the previous videos, seen this strategy used before, you should be screaming at the computer screen exactly why that cannot be the case. It is because the lower Riemann sums get indefinitely close to this value x. So this u that is strictly less than x, it has some distance between it and x here. 
I will be able to find you a lower Riemann sum that is closer to x than that distance, i.e. a lower Riemann sum that is here on the picture. But that's no good at all. That's nonsense, because now we've got a lower Riemann sum that is bigger than an upper Riemann sum, which we know cannot happen. So, therefore, this upper Riemann sum that was strictly less than x cannot possibly have existed. Hence, all the upper Riemann sums must be greater than or equal to x. So, x must be a lower bound for the upper Riemann sum. So, that's why x is a lower bound. Why is it the greatest lower bound, making it the infimum? Well, if we were to consider anything that was strictly greater than it here as a possible lower bound, so we're thinking of this as being a better candidate for the infimum of the upper Riemann sums than x, why can it not actually be a better candidate? Well, it's because it's not actually going to be a lower bound for the upper Riemann sums because we know the upper Riemann sums get indefinitely close to x. So this new candidate in yellow here, this thing that doesn't exist, this, um, what shall I call it? We could call it, I'm running out of things to call it. We'll call it lowercase l, but no, that's not a good choice. Let's just call it the better choice for x that might exist, x bar. I've been doing some stats work, so x bar, we'll call it. Um, so why can this not exist? Because the upper Riemann sums get indefinitely close to x. So there's some distance here between x bar and x, and you'll have upper Riemann sums that are closer to x than that distance, i.e. that are strictly less than x bar, contradicting x bar being a lower bound for all of the upper Riemann sums. Hence, we have proven that it is a lower bound for the upper Riemann sums x, and it must be the greatest of those lower bounds. So it is the infimum. So that proves that x is indeed this infimum of um, the upper Riemann sums. Now what we want to prove is that it's the supremum of the lower Riemann sums, and the argument is the exact mirror image. So firstly, we want to prove that it is a upper bound for the lower Riemann sums, and then we want to prove that it is the least upper bound. So why does it have to be an upper bound? Well, it's because if it wasn't an upper bound, that would mean that there would have to be some lower Riemann sum, and this picture is becoming awfully cluttered. But we'll do it in green again. There would have to be some lower Riemann sum here in green that was strictly greater than x. Remember, x is in white there. So some lower Riemann sum that was strictly greater than it. That's if x is not an upper bound for all of the lower Riemann sums. There would have to be one that's strictly greater than it. But then there is some distance between x and l, and we know that the upper Riemann sums get indefinitely close to x, so we'd be able to find one that is strictly less than l, but that's nonsense. You can't have an upper Riemann sum that's less than a lower Riemann sum. So there, hence, this one cannot have existed. So x must be an upper bound for the lower Riemann sums, i.e. greater than or equal to all of the lower Riemann sums. The next part is proving that it's the least upper bound. Well, again, you just hypothesize the existence of a better um, least upper bound, so a smaller thing, which we'll again show in yellow here, replacing that blue line. And again, this can be called x bar, the better um, candidate for a least upper bound of the lower Riemann sums here. But why can that not be the case? Because the lower Riemann sums get indefinitely close to x. So there's some distance here between x bar and x, and you'll get lower Riemann sums that are closer to x than that distance. So they're strictly greater than this, contradicting this being an upper bound. So nonsense. Uh, the x must be the least, uh, sorry, the, yes, the least upper bound. So x is indeed an upper bound for the lower Riemann sums, and it is the least upper bound. So the, hence we have proven that x is both the infimum of the upper Riemann sums and the supremum of the lower Riemann sums. So we have proven, therefore, that they are equal to one another. The function is Riemann integrable over this interval, and the value of that Riemann integral is the value of the infimum and the supremum, and that's this value x. So overall, what I hope I have convinced you there is that if I find a real number and I can show you that the upper Riemann sums get indefinitely close to it from above and the lower Riemann sums get indefinitely close to it from below, meaning whatever closeness you like, greater than zero, you can find an upper or lower Riemann sum respectively that is within that closeness above or below respectively, uh, you know, the appropriate one, whether we're talking about upper or lower Riemann sums, then the function will be Riemann integrable and that x value will be the value of the uh, Riemann integral.
So that's a strategy for showing that a function is Riemann integrable that we have used in previous videos and we will use here now.